Welcome to you all. It's a great crowd, um, and it's a great topic. The goal of the Georgetown Center on Business and Public Policy is, in this series of discussions, is to provide a reasoned conversation about important current issues in international trade that includes varied viewpoints. Today, we leap into the middle of the hottest current trade topic, that is, whether and how Trade Promotion Authority, also called Fast Track Authority, can help generate jobs for the U.S. and our trading partners, a goal that I'm sure everyone here shares. And is that as if that were not enough, we'll focus today on how TPA can help us deal with one of the major new 21st century issues in trade policy, and that is the freedom of cross-border data flows and digital trade. The new digital trade and cross-border data flows section of the new bipartisan TPA bill authorizes the USTR to seek to apply the protections that we have negotiated in our existing trade agreements to these new forms of commerce. In other words, what we're trying to do in this bill, in case uh, some of you don't know, um, because we tend to talk trade talk here and maybe TPA isn't that familiar to you, but this is a way to give, to instruct the president, as has been done since the 50s, since the really, really the beginning of the reciprocal trade program under FDR, um, and Cordell Hall has been to give the president the authority to uh, go out and negotiate benefits for this country's economy. Um, and this current TPA um, is really uh, one in a series of, of these necessary laws that authorize the president, instruct the president what his goals ought to be, what his and his team's goals ought to be in seeking to open up, open up trade and create new jobs. And um, so the, I, I recommend you to the bill um, and uh, to the section of the bill, section 2A6, I think, well be, that, um, that provides for, that authorizes president, the president to pursue agreements in this particular area of cross-border trade and digital, digital trade. Clearly, there is a need for this authority and for actions to realize its potential um, in uh, international trade agreements, which now ignore the reality that cross-border data flows are the guts of the 21st century trading system and will dominate its future. As a result, we are experiencing a burst of data protectionism. A broad array of digital trade barriers now flourishes where trade rules have failed or not existed. Barriers like legal bans, physical blocking, selective filtering and slowing down of foreign websites, data nationalism expressed in data localization requirements, go, to, go away, uh, and excessive privacy protections. This is um, by no means a complete catalog. We have a great uh, panel to discuss these issues today. We've asked each to limit their remarks to, remarks to seven minutes at the outset, a difficult ask, I know, as there is so much to say. Um, but we want to leave time for your questions and discussions. Our first speaker is Brad Jensen, Professor of International Business and Economics at the Pagnetta School of Business at Georgetown, a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute, and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. He will begin today by sketching the scope and the size of our cross-border trade in order to give you a quick picture of what's at stake commercially. Laura Lane, is President, Global Public Affairs at UPS. She was previously a Managing Director and Head of International Government Affairs at Citigroup. Before joining Citi, Laura was Vice President for Global Public Policy with Time Warner. To add to this amazing record, Laura was a USTR trade negotiator where she and I first met <laughs> in her role as negotiator for financial services, and I won't say the year. Um, she will discuss the potential of TPA for internet based trade in the logistics sector, uh, bringing, drawing on her experience in financial services, media services, and of course, her, and of course from her perspective as a former trade negotiator. Brian Biren is executive director of the eBay Public Policy Lab and a leader in the eBay Incorporated Global Government Relations team. He has been at the nexus of technology and commercial policy, including taxation, telecommunications, customs, and intellectual property. Notably, he worked here on the Hill for 12 years, including a stint with D uh, David Dreyer, Congressman David Dreyer, Chairman of the Rules Committee. Uh, he will discuss the importance of TPA from the standpoint of the internet economy. 
Uh, Dr. Joshua Meltzer is a fellow in, in global economy and development at Brookings, an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins SICE, and at Georgetown Law. He will discuss the potential for international agreements to ensure cross-border data flows and combat some of the issues that I mentioned earlier. Um, just before I start, I want to say that many of us here, especially on the panel, are trade wonks uh, who speak a strange lingo of acronyms and specialized phrases known only to us. So uh, we'll try to dumb this to, I'm sorry, not dumb it down, make it plain. Uh, try not to use the lingo and uh, don't be afraid to ask any questions if you don't know what the heck we're saying. So it's really great to start with Brad Jensen, who is one of the clearest and best talking economists I know. Um, that may be damnation with faint praise, but <laughs> <laughs> take it away, Brad. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Um, so I have the unenviable task of trying to put some numbers around the scope of the economic importance of data flows. Um, when attempting to do this, if anyone in the room here has attempted to do this, it becomes readily apparent that there is no data <laughs> on data flows. Uh, the government doesn't collect anything on data flows. Uh, most uh, important participants, market participants in this area are reluctant to provide information about data flows. Uh, so there's a huge vacuum in what we know. Uh, people have tried to gauge the importance of data flows by measuring related things. And I'm going to try to put some of those numbers out there as, as you know, maybe think of it as little tiles in a mosaic or things that are representative, almost like anecdotes that will help us try to get a sense of how important, how much is at stake uh, in this. So some examples of where data flows might be important. We could think of e-commerce. Uh, we could think about digitally enabled trade. We could think about trade in digital goods and services. And we could think about ICT, um, internet, computer, and uh, telephony enabled trade, and so on and so forth. So I, I'm not going to provide data on data flows. There isn't any. Uh, but I'm going to talk about, just to give a sense of how important the bits and bytes that are moving across lines might be to various sectors. So the Census Bureau collects information on e-commerce, and while most of my comments are going to be about the service sector, even in manufacturing, kind of old line manufacturing, if you look at revenue, uh, almost 50% of revenue is sold via electronic commerce in the manufacturing sector. Now this isn't trade, uh, this is just all sales, uh, but I don't think there's any reason to suspect that international sales would be markedly different. So a big chunk of manufacturing sales are flowing through uh, the internet. Uh, we could think about digitally enabled trade in terms of eBay, uh, marketplaces like eBay and Amazon, and, I think Brian will talk about the importance of that. We could look at trade in digital goods. If you look at music, almost 60% of music is uh, sold digitally uh, over you know, the internet. Uh, in terms of video games, it's 40%. Uh, video, 30%. Books, it's 20%. Uh, that, that's digital. It's not, it's not that Amazon's selling a hard copy, it's that it's digital, it's a digital book. Uh, if we look at ICT-enabled trade, and here the Bureau of Economic Analysis has identified some industries, uh, service industries, that they view as internet-enabled, they say that 61% of U.S. service exports are in ICT-enabled services. That's a big number, and it's, and it's grown significantly. Uh, in the late 90s, it was about 40% of U.S. service exports. Now it's over 60% of U.S. service exports. So this is important, and I'll come back to uh, service exports. I think these all are important information when we think about the actual exchange, but I think if you pause for a moment and think about how pervasive uh, the data flows are, you know, pause for a minute and think about managing a multinational enterprise. So even if you're not selling from the U.S. to a customer, 
uh, in a foreign country over the internet, but instead you've opened an office in the foreign country and are selling from that foreign affiliate in the foreign country. Now the sale may not happen over the internet, but to manage your multinational corporation, you probably want to have information, you know, for human resources purposes on employees from your affiliates, say in Europe. Probably want to bring that data back to the United States to look at how your enterprise is doing, right? You may want to bring customer information back. Uh, that's going to be a data flow. Right? If, if you step on the air hose of allowing that data to flow back and forth, it's going to become really difficult to manage your multinational enterprise. And again, just to put some scoping on it, if we look at U.S. service exports, which are about 30% of U.S. exports, uh, the sales of service affiliates in foreign countries are double that. Okay, so for you know, big service firms, these affiliate sales are really important. So thinking about managing the multinational enterprise and making that more difficult could produce important impediments to U.S. Uh, services firms. So, so you know, think about financial services. It's a lot about identifying customer needs and managing risk. Uh, if you can't pool or aggregate information across a lot of markets, it's going to be difficult to provide products and services to customers. So again, this is an example of where uh, stopping data flows is going to make it difficult. Um, so no hard data. I think uh, little tiles uh, in a mosaic to say, suggest that this is crucially important to um, U.S. firms. I think U.S. service firms in particular have a huge unrealized opportunity. Uh, if you think about the business service sector, it's 25% of the economy in the United States. So just, again, to put some scope on that, that's two and a half times the size of the manufacturing sector. <laughs> a lot of this stuff is tradable. A lot of it's being traded. Uh, in spite of that, uh, there's not enough participation. So if we look at uh, firm participation in exporting, comparing uh, business service firms to manufacturing, it lags significantly. About 20% of manufacturing firms export, only about 4% of service firms export. Uh, if we look at exports to sales ratios, similar disparities. 20% of U.S. manufacturing output is exported. Only about 4% of U.S. business services output is exported. So there's a lot of headroom. So this should be increasingly important. This is an area where the U.S. has comparative advantage. These information intensive activities are where we shine. Uh, putting impediments on this information flow could be very detrimental uh, to U.S. firms. Thanks, Brad. Oops. <laughs> Laura, take it away. So I'll pick it up from there. Um, given my background, I have... Um, you push your button. I got the Italian in me. I thought it'd overpower. <laughs> um, given my background, um, I want to share with you a couple different perspectives on the critical importance of trade promotion authority and how it um, has been critically important from the various vantage points that I've had. Um, Bob uh, mentioned some of my career. I actually started out as a foreign service officer serving in uh, Bogota, Colombia. I also served in Kigali, Rwanda, and had opportunities to serve in a lot of different foreign postings where um, a lot of the advocacy as an economic officer was about how important it was to open up markets and, um, and have a strong bilateral economic relationship with the United States. Moving to the U.S. Trade Representative's office, I can tell you I had one of the biggest challenges in terms of negotiating a financial services, a global financial services agreement at the height of the Asian financial crisis, negotiating a basic telecommunications agreement to open up opportunities for basic telecommunications, and many of our strong uh, 
American telecom companies to be able to export their products and services around the world, and then had the task of uh, being the services negotiator um, in uh, China's accession to the WTO, where one of our biggest pushes was on opening the Chinese market to services. Uh, and um, from that perspective, I can tell you that Trade Promotion Authority strengthened my hand as a negotiator at the negotiating table. Because what TPA did is it said, here are the priorities that the U.S. government has and that U.S. companies have and that U.S. civil society has in terms of how we, the, the United States of America, want to engage in bilateral trade or regional or multilateral trade with other countries. It said what the priorities were that the negotiators had to achieve in any agreement. It strengthened my hand because in sitting at the table, I had the full force of all the American people, essentially, by virtue of the vote on TPA, saying this is what matters to us and this is what we're expecting out of the deal. On the other side, it also um, helped clarify um, in terms of what the economic interests were at stake, as well as the interests of the unions, the environmental groups, and a lot of the other important voices on trade, so that as I was at the negotiating table, I was crafting solutions that took those into account. And I can promise you, through the course of all of the negotiations that I was involved in, there was regular dialogue back and forth with Congress, with the key committees, talking about what we were hearing from um, our counterparts on the other side of the negotiating table and um, some of the ideas that we were trying to advance, and, and coming up with good solutions for how to secure a very high standard, commercially meaningful agreement. So from that perspective, I would say this is one of those critical votes that is critically important from a bipartisan perspective in terms of arming the negotiators to come home with good agreements that represent the interests of everyone across America. Now, you know I'm coming from UPS, right? So why would UPS care about trade? Trade is one of the most important issues for our company. We have 400,000 employees uh, around the world. We provide services in over 200 countries and territories. So um, we are a multimodal transportation company. You see our brown trucks, but we also ride things on the rails. We also fly things in the air. And our job is to connect customers wherever they are um, with their customers around the world. So so for us, crossing borders and trade are vitally important. Let me tell you why it's so economically significant for our company, and I, I, I would preface it by saying we're a proud union company. We are a teamster and machinist company, um, and we have over 200,000 union employees in our, in our um, workforce. And um, for all of them, they understand that trade is critically important because every 22 packages that cross a border supports a job in our network. And you better believe we want to see that volume grow. Um, we want to see more opportunities. So we're always looking at ways that we can work with customers to try to open markets. So we're big advocates, not just for the trade and services that we engage in, express delivery services, but we're also advocates for every customer that we ship their goods or their services um, through our planes, trains, or uh, package cars. Um, so from that perspective, uh, we are big advocates for trade in terms of reducing tariffs, um, non-tariff barriers, eliminating the customs challenges that prevent some of the small and medium-sized companies from being able to cross borders, and figuring out ways to facilitate trade. Now, put it in perspective. How does UPS do what it does? We're a technology company at the, at the end of the day, because here's the reality. Everything we do is database. If you think about it, we have to, in everything we ship, everything, you know, the packages, the parts, the pharmaceutical products, whatever we're delivering, we've got to lead with data. In other words, when a package gets sent anywhere in the world, we've got to send the data that accompanies it 
beforehand. The data arrives across the border to the customs officials um, well before that package actually crosses the border. And you know what? We follow with data because you think about it, you as customers, whether you're a business or you're a private citizen, you want to track and trace your package. You want to know where it is in the distribution network. And you know what? That all requires access to data. So think about it, if, if we cut, shut down those data flows, we'd be shutting down all of the ability to trade in commerce. Um, and, and when I think about it, this is one of the most fundamental issues that we as an American community need to grapple with in terms of liberalizing trade. Because if you think about it, we've made tremendous progress in terms of breaking down barriers to trade. We've done amazing work in the World Trade Organization and through free trade agreements. But the minute you put up a barrier to data for any company now, you've basically obviated everything that we've accomplished in the years past, because data is the essence of everything. It goes before the package, it goes before the product, and it follows it. So you've got to have the data flowing. Let me share my perspective from the three companies that I worked for. Think about Time Warner and um, a lot of its movies and music and TV programs. Everything's digital now. The, the supply chain or the production lines are all digital. You think about some of the super cool uh, special effects that are made into these movies now. Did you know that Time Warner, Warner Brothers, New Line Cinema, HBO, they, they use global supply chains for a lot of their digital effects, working on a project at night, sending it out to Asia for another set of animators or digital effects folks to add on to it to produce that movie faster in a global time frame, um, but that requires moving the data across borders. Similarly, in selling it now, uh, as consumers, it's not just move, move music, but movies that are being sold across borders. So the TPA um, uh, provisions that support cross-border data flow, as well as intellectual property right protection, are critically important for a, uh, an industry sector here in the United States, the entertainment industry, that is one of the most globally uh, uh, competitive. We need to protect their interests. Co think about it from the perspective of financial services. You can't make it, move it, buy it, or sell it without services, and you got to have the money flow behind it, right? So from the perspective of Citigroup, we operated in over 200 countries around the world. We wanted to see data flows because that is the underpinning for all the financial flows. If you want to engage in trade, you want to get, it, you want to get paid in the end for the product that you're, you're selling. Well, all those financial flows go through one of the most robust financial data networks that is operated by Citigroup and a number of the other financial institutions. You shut down that data flow, you shut down the payment systems. Think about it from the perspective of UPS then. We want all that flow of data because we want to be delivering all those products and services that depend on those data flows. But it's not just from the perspective of facilitating that trade. Like Brad said, we are a multinational corporation. We have accounts receivable and payables. We have global HR data. We've got information that's part of our operations in terms of managing our flight movements across borders, in terms of trucking movements across borders, tolling information, information about um, our drivers, the routes that they're taking, how we can get fuel savings. All of that depends on data flows. You shut that down, you shut down the efficiencies of a company like UPS. So when you think about Trade Promotion Authority, think about it from all of these perspectives. One, we've got to be advancing interests that are important for the American people, and those are the ones that reflect supporting economic growth and opportunity, for which data flows are a critical underpinning. Two, we've got to make sure that we're addressing the 21st century issues because our companies have the competitive advantage in terms of having incorporated technology and using data efficient, efficiently to be better and more cost effective and more efficient in the services they're providing. We've got to ensure that uh, protection of cross-border data flows is incorporated in uh, the TPA bill. And, and last, we've got to be advancing a very robust trade agenda, because here's the reality. The U.S. right now is negotiating um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, 
We've launched the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Agreement, and uh, we are working on a trade and services agreement in the WTO. All of those are vitally important in terms of protecting U.S. Uh, competitive economic interests. But the world is negotiating, lot, negotiating lots more free trade agreements day after day. We've got to be at the negotiating table, continuing to advance U.S. values, U.S. economic interests. And the only way you do that is strengthen those negotiators at the negotiating table and give them TPA so we can be negotiating more deals that are consistent with um, the priorities that we have in terms of growing our economy. Thanks. Good job. Thanks, Laura. Brian. Uh, thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> the request to have a seven minute speech, I usually have like a five minute speech or a 10 minute speech. So I'm going to try hard to squeeze this into the, like the seven minute version. But I want to thank Laura in particular for really spending some time explaining that, you know, the internet and global data networks have fundamentally transformed the entire economy. And, and I don't think it's really from sort of a gee whiz isn't the world a great place perspective, but much more from a perspective of can you imagine doing anything as a business, big or small, even as an individual these days, without some underlying digital service? I mean, it's just how the world works. And, and so that's the way the world operates. It's all digital in some way. I mean, there are a few people, I, my, to my daughter, my seven-year-old, just signed up to have a pen pal, and I asked my wife, is she gonna like actually write a letter to her pen pal, or is she gonna like email her pen pal? No, no, they're gonna write. I'm like, wow, okay, that's cool. Um, so the world operates on digital services. The internet, digital, has transformed the economy. It's absolutely transformed trade. Global trade just operates in a different way today than it ever did before. And if nothing else, I think the idea that this, would, this will be the first TPA Act and the first trade negotiations that are really based on the internet economy, which I think is really key. And, and it's in particularly important to eBay, I think, eBay Inc., for a unique reason that I'm going to explain here. Um, and I'll step back really quickly to say who's, you know, ask the question, who's eBay Inc., what is eBay Inc.? eBay Inc. is eBay, uh, one of the world's largest internet global marketplaces where stuff is traded by all size uh, businesses, individual entrepreneurs, even consumers. We're PayPal, which is one of the world's largest uh, technology-based payment service um, operating in, I believe, 190 countries these days. And then also eBay Enterprises, which is a uh, global services provider for larger retails, retail businesses. So we look at global trade really while we have hundreds of millions of users globally, we have 500,000 small businesses and entrepreneurs that I'd like folks to focus on here, about half of them in the U.S. These are individual entrepreneurs all the way up to uh, larger businesses, but most of these 500,000 are like micro-businesses. Small businesses is in, in a way that is really smaller than the sort of traditional U.S. government view of small business. We're not talking about businesses that are 500 employees. We're talking about five or 10 person businesses that might sell a couple million dollars. One of the things that we've realized just in the last couple years is the fact that essentially every one of those micro businesses is operating globally. It is to the point where if you are going to be an internet enabled small business, because the internet economy is by definition, the network is global, you literally have to work to not be global. And the, and the numbers are absolutely astounding between the global activities of internet-enabled small businesses versus traditional small businesses. Just to toss a few numbers out, and this, we've really focused at eBay on putting some data behind this for exactly, I think, the reason that Brad points out, that there's so little data out there. So we've really worked to add some data to the debate. To give you some perspective, traditional small businesses, ten, less than 5% tend to export. Internet-enabled small businesses, 97% plus export. Traditional small businesses, they average one or two export countries. And when you think about it, a non-internet-enabled small business that's exporting, they're probably on the border somewhere. Maybe they have family connections to a particular country, so they do some cross-border trade. Internet-enabled small businesses, and again, these are not 500-person businesses. These are four- and five-person businesses in many cases. They average 25 plus countries per year 
that they sell to. Growth rates, survival rates, and the share of trade being done by the smaller businesses. You know, traditional global trade, huge percentages of the commerce are being done by like your top 5% of the firms. On the internet, that's not the case. A much larger share of the commerce is being done by much smaller businesses. And lastly, what we've learned in the last couple years is that these trends, these data points are truly global. Like we started our work looking at data in the United States and then in our other big markets, places like Germany and the UK. We've recently been looking, so what does this look like for a small business in Peru or Indonesia or India? And we're finding out that all of these data points are the same. 97% plus exporting, 25 plus countries, survival rates, all higher. So our, our message is that the thing, one of the things that's been revolutionized by the internet economy is the fact that globalization can now involve a huge, large share of the population as opposed to in the past. This is no longer, global trade is not anymore about just your 500 biggest multinationals, despite the fact that we've talked a lot about what would end up being sort of like 500 big multinationals in banking and logistics and insurance and, 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 and internet. The reality is that micro businesses around the world have now an opportunity to engage in global commerce directly, which from the perspective of the kind of things when I was sitting back in, in your chairs and was here through NAFTA and the Get Uruguay Round and talking about trade with China, like the reality is there is a political perception problem with globalization. We totally get it. There are a lot of folks who believe the system doesn't work for everyone. What we are here to say is that the data is coming in that because of technology and the internet, it actually can increasingly work for everyone. That anything that makes sense for a giant company actually makes sense for a micro company too. And the, and the global regime can be far more inclusive. And all the economic reasons why trade works for really big companies, they actually all the same economic rationale works for tiny little companies too, which means there's a tremendous economic benefit that comes about from opening up global trade more and more to the littlest businesses everywhere. And then lastly, there's a political benefit as well. Face it, making the system more inclusive absolutely helps defend what the whole global trade regime is about. And so we would say the reason why we need TPA for the internet age is because we and you all want to promote the kind of commerce that the internet can enable. And so we, I'm, I often am on events and sitting next to folks like UPS because face it, our marketplaces and our payment services, they help tiny businesses around the world sell stuff to consumers on the other side of the world. Never would have been doable without an internet marketplace like eBay or payment services like PayPal. But it also isn't possible if you can actually ship the package. And our trade agreements have been built around Making it, you know, trade facilitation, for example, for years was about how do you make it easier for a really big company to like source products in one, let's say, low wage country and like make sure you can move that ship across the world and get the stuff out in a port here in the US and out to stores. You know, that's like retail, 1995. Today, trade agreements should be focused on the challenge of how can you get the package from the person's little golf supply store, you know, pro shop in Augusta, Georgia, to a golfer who happens to live in South Africa. Because there's a ton of opportunity there. It's a global opportunity. And, you know, it's a different set of challenges. But they shouldn't be any harder. UPS is showing it can be done. It's just a matter of how do you actually have trade agreements focus on that. So, so with that, I'd say, I hope that you all walk away recognizing that one of the things the internet has revolutionized is not just the fact that every big company in the world uses all these data flows, uses the internet in various ways to operate a multinational corporation, but that the micro businesses do exactly the same thing. And this will be the first trade promotion authority bill and, and hopefully the first trade agreements that make that a real focus because of the economic, social, and honestly, global political benefits of making our system more inclusive. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Joshua? Thanks. Um, so as, as the only uh, non-American on this panel, um, I still think TPA is very important. But what I think I'm going to do is uh, provide a little bit of an international take on this and bring it back to the significance of TPA. And in fact, you know, listening to, to Laura and Brian, um, you know, you walk away wondering why this is actually an issue um, and in fact what is um, happening in terms of cross-border data flows because, you know, the benefits are so broad-based and significant. Um, what are we confronted with here? So I might just spend a minute or two talking about, in fact, what the challenges are which can then get us into why the tr trade agreement space is very important in order to address these barriers. Um, because actually what we're seeing is that despite the importance of cross-border data flows for the international economy writ large, um, governments are actually right now looking to intervene in various different ways in cross-border data flows. And this is being done for a whole variety of reasons. Now some of them we can understand and possibly put in a box as being somewhat legitimate. For instance, there are concerns around data privacy, there are concerns around intellectual property protection, there are concerns about access to particular content on the material which governments might want to regulate, child pornography for instance. And so there are legitimate reasons where governments are going to think about ways they want to regulate the internet. There are other reasons. We see, for instance, with uprisings in Egypt and Iran blocking access to net social networking sites and Twitter. We also see very distinct commercial restrictions when China redirects um, search traffic from Google to Baidu when they block access to the New York Times. These are also clearly restrictions on the cross-border data flows and a lot of them are discriminatory and clearly restrictions on international trade. And that's just to mention a few. Um, data localization requirements, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard. Brazil at the moment is looking at, a, at, its, at an internet law at the moment which would require all data on Brazilian citizens to be held in country. Right? And, 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 the, and there are a range of reasons governments put forward for this. They talk about the need to have data there for law enforcement purposes um, in order to increase the security of their data. Um, but it's also about creating, an, it's an infant industry policy in many respects as well, the idea that if they can have a data centre built domestically that that will create some type of industry. Now a lot of these um, reasons, I think once you start thinking about cross-board data flows and the internet as platforms and as enablers for, internet, in, in, for economic growth and international trade, you begin to realise um, actually those goals are not going to be achieved and often there's going to be a lot of unintended um, economic consequences. Let me just talk quickly about uh, um, data localization. If you, if you require companies to hold data in a particular country, then what you're probably going to do is create data insecurity because data centres are set up in very specific locations based on a whole range of factors such as governance, legal, whether these places are subject to natural disasters, availability and reliability of your electricity supplies. And so if you force them to be built where they wouldn't be built, you're probably actually going to increase the insecurity of your citizens' data. There's nothing inherently more secure about holding data in one jurisdiction than in another. Um, back onto the economic side, data centres are a key for enabling the cloud. And if you require companies to build data centres across the world, cloud computing is going to be very expensive and particularly small and medium-sized enterprises which can use the, use the cloud to access IT services and infrastructure, scale up when business circumstances require, are just not going to be able to do that. And we, can, we could name hundreds and hundreds of companies which you would now think about as fairly large um, companies which probably would not have ever got off the ground if they'd not been able to afford cheap and accessible cloud services. So it's just one example. Now in terms of, the, I think this just highlights the need to actually make sure that we can develop some disciplines in the trade agreements for actually getting at a lot of these challenges. Now the WTO, um, the World Trade Organization, as I'm sure a lot of you know, is um, a, a, a round which is going very, very slowly. Some progress was made at, at a ministerial meeting in December, um, but it's not the place at the moment where this is being addressed. And really the key areas which um, have been briefly referred to already are going to be the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is between the US and the EU, and what's called the Trade and Services Agreement, which is a larger negotiation. And I'll talk about each of those ones um, briefly. The, the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiation, which is really what TPA is kind of focused on at the moment, though of course will be broader than that, um, is hopefully going to wrap up you know, in the first half of this year. And getting more um, important and tighter disciplines on cross-border data flows has certainly been a focus. Now there are some commitments already in the WTO on financial services, 
and these were built on and expanded on in the Korea United States FTA. And actually in the Korea United States FTA, an important step was made to create a commitment more broadly for cross-border data flows, where the parties essentially said that they endeavour to ensure that they're not going to restrict cross-border data flows. But the important thing is, firstly, this is an, a best endeavours only commitment, so there's nothing actually particularly binding about it, and it is also subject to a fairly rigorous exceptions provision. Now, what needs to be built on this in terms of the TPP is that you need to actually have binding commitments to allow the free flow of data and information across borders, and this is exactly where they are trying to make some progress. Now, what's coming up in this negotiation is how do you actually apply an exception? So as I was mentioning before, um, if you want to say, for instance, intervene for a privacy issue or for a particular content issue which you think is offensive, you need to provide some flexibility, some room for governments to achieve um, legitimate regulatory purposes, but you really want them to do it in a way which is least trade restrictive, right? So it's not saying you can't go and achieve other legitimate goals, but you really need to think carefully about how do you do this in a way which minimises its impact on international trade. And this is exactly what the type of disciplines that are being talked about are trying to do. Now what's happening is regulators from across the board, because you can imagine now the variety of regulators that get involved in this issue because of the breadth of the issue, don't want to have to justify their regulation in terms of is it necessary, is it least, least trade restrictive. And sort of this highlights again how much progress we need to make on making the argument about why cross-border data flows is not a US issue, it's not an IT sector issue, it's a broad economic issue. In the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is just started out and um, you know, a lot more progress is going to be made on that this year, the US and the EU in, in some respects are natural economic entities to take forward this argument. You know, both developed economies with, with, with multinational enterprises who appreciate and understand the importance of cross-border data flows um, for their economies and also the gains that can be made globally. The key issue in this space is going to be addressing privacy. Um, because the EU has a very different privacy regime to the United States and essentially the way the EU regime works is it doesn't allow EU citizens' data to be exported unless the country of import has a comparable essentially privacy regime. Now, the US and the EU have got around some of this so far by developing what's called a safe harbour agreement, which essentially allows companies in the US to self-certify, to say that they comply with a safe harbour framework, um, and then basically once that's done, they're deemed comparable and the data can flow. But it's a limited sort of patch, in a sense, because it's a whole range of sectors that it doesn't apply to, um, energy, financial services, media, just to name a couple. Um, so getting at the interaction between cross-border data flows and privacy is going to be important in the context of this agreement. And it's important not only from a transatlantic perspective in terms of making data flow between the US and the EU, it's, it's also important because privacy is an issue where countries around the globe are increasingly introducing privacy laws. The first privacy law was introduced in Sweden in 1973. There are now 76, 77 privacy laws across the world and the number is growing rapidly. So getting a framework right in the context of the transatlantic space is important and also could be a model for building that out globally. On the trade in services agreement, there's approximately 50 countries involved, the United States as well, obviously, representing around about 70% of services trade. Now, the interesting thing about this negotiation is that China wants to join. Now, there's uh, some work, I think, that the US government has to do in terms of working out whether this is the best thing. But if they do join, this is going to be a space where some of these issues can be discussed with China in the context of a live trade negotiation. So it provides some possibilities, some opportunities here to make some real progress with a country which is certainly intervening in the free flow of data across borders. So I think there's an opportunity there as well. And I'll just finish by, I think, probably reaffirming some of the points that have been made here, which is I think that going forward, what needs to happen is to conceptualise the internet as a platform. 
um, whether it, it is providing a business input into uh, it's, which allows businesses to become more productive and competitive both domestically and internationally, whether it's using an online auction site like as eBay to actually sell goods and services to customers around the globe, um, it is a general purpose technology. It's like electricity. It is a, an opportunity, it's a technology which enables economic activity. So it's not about trying to replicate an eBay, trying to replicate a Google. It's about using this um, world of internet enabling services to actually allow broad economic sectors to grow. Good. Thank you. Well, I think that's an extremely rich uh, and uh, broad uh, discussion, background discussion of what's at stake here. Uh, really impressive. And I want to just tell you all that uh, this is being videoed, as you can see, and that that video will be available on the center's website within a reasonable period of time. Uh, we appreciate that a lot. So um, we'd love to have some questions. Um, and um, I've got one and I've got two. Let's go down here to the end of the, the row. You. I'm Tom Goldberg. I'm with a company called Lineage Technologies. Uh, earlier this week, uh, McKinsey and the World Economic Forum came out with an ITC uh, projection report based on two years of surveys that are looking at the Snowden moment and some of the IP and IT thefts as creating a rather significant speed bump. They estimate the ITC market between now and, and uh, 2020 to be about somewhere between nine and $21 trillion internationally. They think a speed bump could uh, reduce the potential by as much as $3 trillion. Mm. So I, I would be very interested in comments about that. And the other thing I'd be curious to, to understand is that in the McKinsey recommendations, they're saying that in the absence of an international uh, law enforcement mechanism by which the malefactors, or in the case of nation states, the encouragement that nation states stop stealing IP from one another, uh, in the absence of that, there needs to be, uh, <coughs> Meltzer said a lot of emphasis on privacy and protection and that, that may end up being either imposed by companies or, or be required by companies to be imposed by governments. And I'd be curious about your comment. Okay, what's to take that on? Brian. Well, I would just start by saying I haven't seen the study, so it's kind of a challenge to comment on the specific study. I'll say that um, from our perspective, actually, the um, the data-based sort of global internet economy actually has far more uh, transparency and, um, and an ability, I think, to protect privacy. These are issues that, you know, piracy, counterfeiting, data th uh, theft, personal information theft, you know, these are all things that, that you know, very much predate the internet. These are things that bad folks do and have done for a long time. Um, you know, certainly in the, in the eBay Inc. world, we've worked very hard, for example, with rights owners around the world um, to use our services to help them um, keep track of what's going on uh, with uh, trade, um, whether it's inside countries or, or outside. And, and we actually think that works better um, than the sort of traditional way businesses have tried to stop piracy, which is like, how do you track things down at, at, the, uh, at the ports and in cities around the world where, um, you know, illegal stuff gets sold. At the same time, I do believe that balanced intellectual property, which recognizes how the internet enables really small businesses everywhere to engage in commerce everywhere, um, is an important part of future global trade agreements that, that at the end of the day, any argument that tries to segment markets by borders runs directly contrary to trade agreements which try to reduce you know, barriers at the border. So I think the challenge for trade negotiators, and that's really, I hope, one of the things that everyone walks away from this discussion recognizing. TPA empowers trade negotiators to go out and negotiate better deals. You know, that's really all it boils down to. And so the the admonition regarding those kind of issues for U.S. negotiators, I think, would be go out and negotiate agreements that strike the best balance, that allow individuals' privacy to be protected and intellectual property protected, and also promotes economic growth and opportunity 
for all kinds of enterprises, especially in the U.S., but really globally, to you know to grow. And and that and that net net, there's no question in my mind that number one, that the internet promotes that kind of growth. That 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 data offers a lot more positive long term than 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 risk. That the risk can be handled in a manageable, sensible way. And and I think lastly that we need trade agreements based on a 21st century version of TPA so that these kind of issues actually can be fully brought up in trade negotiations that have a hope of getting concluded. Yeah, and I want to add to that that it's not just uh, empowering the administration uh, to go out and negotiate better agreements. It requires them to bring it back, bring them back for validation by the Congress on an admittedly fast-track process. But it is absolutely essential that at the end of the day, the administration is held accountable uh, for uh, to, the, to the extent to which it's met its goals and brought back a balanced agreement that's going to be benefit the American people. So I think you know this is it, it's an authorization at the beginning and it's a way to conclude and approve trade agreements at, at the end. Uh, Laura and then yeah, Brad. I was just going to comment. Um, I was thinking back um, actually when I was in my master's program at Georgetown. I actually did a paper before the internet, I think, was actually really uh, a viable economic tool about the importance of technology having a human face. And the concept is that um, no matter the tools, we need to ensure that the values um, within our society are reflected in uh, any of the tools that anybody has in their hands. So from that perspective, I think about our founders and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which for me includes also engaging economic activity. It's really fundamental that we, um, we have laws and a legal framework in place that allow for people to um, operate uh, freely and engaging in those pursuits. Um, and I think the Snowden question, um, it's, it's a troubling one for me personally because I, I hope it doesn't um, result in putting up a speed bump. Um, I hope instead it, it um, uh, fosters a very robust dialogue about how data can and should be used because we've talked about the economic benefits of having this very powerful tool in technology to be able to engage in uh, freedom of expression and, uh, and in pursuit of economic opportunity while at the same time asking those very legitimate questions about how governments should be able to use uh, uh, data and how um, businesses and individuals should be able to use data. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity to, between the U.S. and the EU to think about that and come up with the right policy paradigm and the legal framework to address that. At the end of the day, I think all of us would, would agree. We want the bad guys stopped. We don't want them out being allowed to commit crimes and use data for nefarious reasons, create a legal framework that prevents that kind of activity. But at the same time, develop the right criteria so that we as individuals are protected from unreasonable uses of our data, while at the same same time, letting governments be able to use it to protect us from those that would want to use it for ill purposes. I think this is an opportunity to engage, not an opportunity to build barriers. And it is the 21st century issue. The global internet exists, and, um, and it has brought tremendous benefits. It's within us to develop the right frameworks with the right lines drawn, I think, in a globally coordinated way <coughs> to ensure that it's fundamentally effective for everyone. Okay. Anybody else want to respond quickly? Brad? So I haven't read the report either, but those are some big numbers uh, that you cite. And I think what's important to keep in mind is uh, they must have made some assumptions about what the policy response would be. And I think that that's what this panel is all about, is what should the policy response be? And I think the, the stronger the U.S. and the more proactive the U.S. can be in the various forums, TPP, TTIP, uh, the ISA, uh, the less bad policy is going to be made and the smaller the bump will be. And I, and I think we should all keep in our mind that the U.S. is a leader in these information-enabled industries. And I think that a lot of countries around the world view the Snowden thing as great cover mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. try to put up barriers to protect domestic incumbents, to try to gain time for national champions. Here, so I here. think that this is really important for the U.S. to secure what is our comparative advantage in these uh, technologies and in these industries. 
to have level rules of the road around the world. Um, you know, the, the less bad policy is made, the smaller that bump will be. Okay, Josh, great. Um, okay, just quickly. Um, look, I think one of the things that comes out of the um, NSA issue is, is fundamentally this question of trust in how people use the internet and put, let, put their data online. I, I think what's clear is that there's still, um, people are just still getting used to the fact that the data um, is actually collected, stored and used in different ways. And the reality of it is a lot of it's still and, and will continue to be done by, by US companies. Now, um, you know, the, the, the problem with the NSA issue is, is not that the NSA surveils the internet, it's how it's conflated national security and essentially economic issues. And, you know, um, as Brad just mentioned, it, it, this has been conflated by governments um, for, for their own purposes. I mean, the Brazil issue I mentioned earlier on, where, you know, directly in response to the NSA issue, they're talking about having to hold, um, you know, Brazilian citizens' data um, in, in, in country. And, and surveys that have come out, I haven't seen this report, I don't know where that fear comes from, but they have all pointed to both large losses for the US cloud computing industry as well as, um, you know, increased hesitancy on the part of people to actually allow US cloud service to hold their data. And so, um, you know, part of the response though here has got to be, I think, getting back to how if you want to for instance, again, if we go back to the Brazilian argument, if you want to sort of segment out the internet, if you want to increase the costs of essentially what is going to be cloud computing or other internet-based services for your country, which is really going to be the results of a lot of these laws, then you're going to harm your economy broadly. And in many respects, what's needed is constituents, actually businesses in these countries making the case that they want to have access to the A-grade internet, they want to have access to the A-grade internet-based services so they can be as productive and competitive as they can be. And you are beginning to hear those voices. You're seeing it now a little bit in Brazil and in Europe. Good, thanks. Welby. So, so um, what many may not realize is UPS has probably got one of the biggest data networks in the world. Um, we deliver to so many addresses. We know how many steps it is to get to someone's front door. We have some of the best geospatial uh, information in the world and, in fact, um, have been thinking about ways that we could use it in cooperation with governments in times of natural disasters because we know where houses are and how many people live in a particular house based on the customer data that we have on shipments we've set so that we can help in real time get quick response to assist people in need. That said, um, UPS sits on a lot of data and it is a privacy policy of ours that we will never, underscore never, sell that personal information. I can promise you there have been a lot of pitches made. It's tremendously valuable and we've had a lot of big data people talk to us about how it can be monetized. But from our perspective, um, it's important that we are able to manage it to serve our customers but not to make money beyond that from it. Uh, and so that is UPS policy. We don't sell customer data, but we do have immense customer data information that we're constantly using internally to provide better products and services to our customers. So a classic example is uh, our MyChoice um, uh, service, where now we communicate back and forth with our customers to say, hey, you're not gonna be home and you want that new iPhone 5 delivered, um, but obviously we can't uh, leave it at your door without a, a signature, but you're gonna be there at four o'clock, we'll redirect our, um, our driver to your house at four o'clock, and we're going back and forth by email with folks. That's the powerful use of data for new innovation and new services. And so um, from a 
privacy perspective, we want to have rules in place, particularly when you think about the transatlantic side and the global nature of our employee base that allows us to move it back and forth, but have clear rules and not have different rules, not have 76 different laws um, that we have to comply with and then compartmentalize all the data in crazy ways that can never be aggregated to develop better services for our customers. Laura, I would think the uh, as the new European privacy uh, regime threaten your business um, by, I, by inhibiting the trans, transmission of the very kind of data you've asked about, you've told about? We are, um, by our nature, an engineering company, and I'm married to an engineer, so it's an incredible opportunity for us to, it's like an engineering problem that we're always going to solve. Does it make it more costly? Does it make it more challenging? Of course it does. But, you know, we would never see it as a threat because our company is a bunch of engineers. They're like, oh, cool, another new idea, that, or another new issue that we've got to find a software or hardware fix for. But it adds costs. Um, Let's go right here now. Uh, personally, just a private question. Uh, is there any uh, thought about giving consumers the uh, choice to opt out of sharing their, their information across borders? Like, for example, if I buy a golf ball online and I say, I don't want you to ship my personal information out overseas, can I click on that somehow? What are the rights of consumers in knowing how the information you're collecting about them, how can they take more control over that and maybe make Well, I mean, let me first follow on to what Laura said to say that honestly, eBay's policies are very similar. We don't sell anybody's data inside eBay Inc. to third parties. Um, the other half of it, and I think she did a great job, which is why I didn't say anything else, because she did such a wonderful job, I think, of explaining that data then also, though, gets used to offer better services. Just like from a UPS perspective, a customer wants to get that iPhone 5 delivered to them where they are. and. Um, that takes data to do that better in the world of eBay Inc. When you decide to buy golf balls and let's say the seller is a golf pro shop in South Africa and it's an American consumer, you know, they want what they want. They want the best price. They want the best service. And they want it to be delivered in the way that they want it. And so data really is what gets used to offer better services. What customers I think tend to not like is bad services, okay? They also don't like the idea that that data that theoretically is provided by them to get a certain kind of service better ends up getting marketed to somebody else totally different that they had no sense that they had a part of. But that actually the, the, the issue of privacy and of data are intrinsically part of any data-based company's business. I mean, if people don't trust their service, and if the data is not secure, you know, those are two things that every, any company that is in this space would, I'm sure, be the first to say. If our consumers don't trust us, we're not going to succeed. And if you have a big data breach, like, that's, that's a real negative. Um, and so I think the idea that customers having a close relationship with their service providers, including how their service providers use data, you know, that's part of the business and that's going to evolve, we tend to think that a big part of it is going to be that customers are going to want better services. And I would say to all of you, you know, how many people do you know are really looking for a dumber phone, you know, or, or, or a dumber web experience, or, or, or a slower, give me slower, less efficient delivery, because I like when the iPhone 5 ends up underneath a bush in my front yard because be I wasn't home. <laughs> Never. Um, until the dog grabs it and moves it over there. And so, you know, so data is a part of service and customers' relationships are, you know, with their service providers are key. And regulation, I totally agree that we don't want 76 different underlying regimes. eBay Inc. happens to be a, one of the early U.S. businesses that actually simply got certified under the European Privacy Directive. And so we've been operating not via a safe harbor, we simply got certified over there, and we believe we've been at the cutting edge of being on the forefront of strong privacy rules. But, you know, the world is changing fast, and the amount of data and the amount of personalization is just exploding. Anybody who followed what was going on at CES this year would recognize that, like, robots in your house and data sensors everywhere and health sensors that you swallow, you know, this is all coming really quickly. 
And government does have a role in thinking about how that's going to work. But at the same time, you know, it's all global too. You know, what we're saying here, every one of these things is global. And so that's where you need government to be empowered to go out and negotiate sensible rules of the road, to promote the things people want, and to promote the economic activity that's going to be good for everyone. Can, can I just pick up on what you said, too? Um, and by the way, on, on, our, on our data um, centers, I, we have a lot of folks that are constantly working to protect that data. And we're big advocates in the context of data privacy and data security of public-private partnerships in terms of ensuring that we can protect the data that we have, but that requires a good dialogue between governments and companies to um, ensure that integrity. You asked, could you opt out? Um, if I'm having to comply with uh, customs obligations, I do have to declare information about who sent it and where it's going to. And if you think about it, UPS has one of the most sophisticated and robust um, secure supply chain mechanisms for ensuring that we know um, what we're shipping to where and are constantly vigilant to make sure that our, um, our logistics networks are not used for shipment of counterfeit goods, for use by terrorist organizations. And so from that perspective, there are requirements that we have legally with all the customs authorities where we do have to share certain kinds of information about who we picked it up from and where it's going to and what is um, you know, on the manifest. Uh, in terms of the ability to say, I don't want my information used for other purposes other than this transaction. As I indicated, UPS doesn't use it for anything but that transaction. And internally to figure out how can we serve you better. Uh, and, um, and so it's not being sold. Uh, that's an important um, uh, service emblem that we have uh, that we think our customers value and that's why we have that policy position. It also goes to our core values about um, us serving our customers and not trying to make more out of you know their information. Thanks. Len Brecken. I can give that a shot. Uh, you know, the, the, um, the, the new provision um, that I referred to in my opening comments on digital trade and cross-border trade uh, that instruct the administration on page 17, in fact, um, as to uh, objectives for trade, agree trade agreements to be reached by trade agreements by the administration, in trade agreements by the administration, do um, precisely embrace, I'd say, the, um, the goals that we followed in the, t in the TPP, the objectives in the TPP. One of the objectives in the TPP is to, in fact, to negotiate a, a provision that pr provides for freedom of data flows, uh, but also for reasonable application of privacy pr protections. Another is state-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, utter need in the 21st century to address competition from uh, large organizations backed by their governments. Here, read China, but not just China. So we're making progress, actually. That's one of the elements of the, of the TPP that is, is moving ahead. Um, there are others, and um, uh, one of them is data, is localization of, of, of servers that has been referred to here, the, 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 the wish by some governments to ensure that they control the, the, the boxes that have the data, which is in entirely, uh, con entirely contradictory to uh, the goal of, of making most efficient use of the cloud and all of the benefits that has for the global economy. So my take, maybe others want to add to that, is that this, this agreement I mean, this, this legislation, this draft legislation, this bill, uh, does very much uh, 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 su support the goals of the administration already being realized, hopefully to be brought to complete realization in the TPP. 
I was just going to say, I, I think the Senate and House uh, Trade Staff did a really fantastic uh, summary on the Bipartisan Congressional Trade Priorities Act of 2014. And if you go through that summary, it's, it's, it's pretty striking and pretty validating um, all the issues that we've talk, talked about and how they've been captured in the, uh, the TPA bill, um, as, as Bob alluded to, um, each of the sections. And they go to the fundamental issues that need to be addressed if we're going to keep trade flows flowing so that commerce can keep flowing. Mm -hmm. Anybody else on that? Okay, other question? Welby, were you satisfied with the answer to your question? I, I was thinking that, you know, we hear an, an awful lot from uh, some NGOs. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of commentary on the web about um, how TPA is, in a sense, um, abusive of the Constitution granting powers to the administration that, that, are, that, that, that the administration can uh, abuse in some fashion, um, and um, uh, playing on the fear that people have uh, uh, not just about big government, but about big business, uh, the social networks, and, um, and uh, the, the security of information, uh, let's say, in my Facebook account. Um, or somebody's, and, and I'm, I'm, just, uh, uh, I'm just concerned that um, we may not be here having uh, somebody from that, that, that point of view that says that TPA is evil, TPA is bad, TPA is violative of the Constitution, TPA gives away too much authority, we cannot trust the administration, we haven't been able to trust them in so many other ways, I'm not saying it myself, but we hear that, um, uh, to, to follow the letter of the law and to bring home an agreement that is consistent with the law that has to be validated in a fast track process, which some people think is, is a bad idea anyway. So I'm just wondering if there's any comment about, uh, how's that, Laura? Well, I was just gonna <laughs> say, how, how super cool is it that those voices have been empowered by social media, the very technology and data flows that we're talking about? Um, how cool is it that they do have that ability to use the internet to communicate those important perspectives that all of us need to consider? Um, and, um, and that's the power of those data flows in and of itself. Uh, that said, I, I, I think that from my perspective, having worked in the various different vantage, you know, the various different places throughout my career, I know about the power of trade and the overwhelming economic benefits. Yes, we need to take into account the important issues about data privacy and how information is used. Yes, we need to take into, into account, you know, the right objectives and values that need to be advanced in these trade agreements. But the Trade Promotion Authority Bill is the opportunity to give voice to those, take into account all those perspectives, and then translate those into the economic objectives that the negotiators uh, need to follow when they're at the negotiating table. And the great part is it doesn't take away anybody's power because at the end of the day, the agreement comes back to the Congress for an up or down vote. And if it doesn't meet those objectives, everyone has the ability to say, no, it didn't meet those objectives. There have been trading agreements that I've been involved in that did not pass muster in the end that could not meet the objectives set out because the counterpart uh, uh, countries that we were negotiating with weren't ready to make those high-level commitments that we were asking for. But most of the times, we've been able to raise the values, raise uh, the, the standards globally through free trade agreements and, and multilateral agreements because the important objectives that have been set out in TPA. We shouldn't lose the opportunity to, to, to clearly state what we need to see coming out of trade agreements. And one of them has to be that critically important ability to protect cross-border data flows. And Bob, if I could say that um, one of my roles up here on Capitol Hill back a long time ago when I had hair uh, was uh, with the Rules Committee. Actually, I see Meredith Broadbent here, commissioner over at the ITC, and she was at the Ways and Means Committee at the time. And those of you who follow this highly arcane TPA process referred to by some old timers as fast track. I was there when we changed that name. It was a bad name at the time because actually trade negotiations are very rarely ever on a fast track. They actually tend to be on a glacial track and, um, and they get measured like yards per, per year sort of down the playing field. And, and actually the consultative process that's embodied in 
Trade Promotion Authority, the old fast track process, is actually a real balance between ongoing congressional consultation and, and input combined with the guarantee of at the end of the day an up or down vote, the idea being that when you're in a negotiation with someone, and I'm sure you all have this at a personal level, if at the end of the day the person at the other side of the table can't guarantee that there'll be at least a final decision made, it becomes very hard to get people to put their final sort of offer on the table. That's all this is really about. And so it really, I, I, and, and nobody loves the internet more than me, and the fact that the internet makes it even easier for people to just put stuff up in writing and, and whatever, you know, there's nobody monitoring that, at least in terms of a censor perspective. Um, you know, they can say what they want, but the reality is that, that the TPA process has a ton of congressional involvement at the beginning, through the middle, and at the end. It's arduous and slow for those who like arduous and slow. But, but it really does boil down to up front, the only real reason to oppose it is if you really have decided you don't like trade. And there are people who don't like trade. Like there are people who fundamentally disagree with the idea that like bigger markets, lower barriers, lower regulatory burdens, less burdensome intervention in the economy. Like some people think that's good to lower those things. Some people like disagree with that whole Adam Smith thing and Ricardo and all this stuff about free trade and think that actually it would be better if we had sort of small, little, isolated economic communities. So if you sort of have that view, then I totally get the fact that letting trade negotiators go out and try to negotiate lower barriers, it doesn't make any sense. And those are the folks who should be like, no, I'm against it because I'm against that sort of fundamental idea. On the other hand, if you believe that lowering the barriers and making larger economic entities with lower barriers for more efficiency and wealth and all that, then it's like TPA just lets the negotiator go out and try to come up with something good. And then it's still going to have to get through a political process that is admittedly like really difficult in this country, in any big country, to get a trade negotiation actually across the finish line. And so it's kind of like, do you want to start the process to try to get some results? From an eBay Inc. perspective, we absolutely think the right answer is yes. And it's not just yes like because our businesses will be more successful and that's good for us, but our businesses will empower people all over the world to be more successful too, including little businesses in like literally every single congressional district in America. And we know that's good for them and good for the economy. And so we say, let the negotiator go try to do a good job to come back with a 21st century trade agreement, whatever it is, TPP or the, or the, or the USEU or the services agreement, any of them. And then at the end of the day, we would say as a business and we would expect every elected official to be saying, well, is it good enough? And you know, make the call then. Okay, um, before asking, uh, giving Brad and, and Joshua a chance to say something too, um, I'm going to uh, thank uh, the Office of uh, uh, Congressman Bustani, Dr. Bustani, uh, uh, Caitlin and Keeley particularly for helping organize this. Uh, we really appreciate the, the venue and the opportunity to be here with you all. Um, so Brad, do you have anything to say further? Josh? Yeah, the only thing I'll say very quickly, again, bringing the non-American hat to the conversation, is that TPA really does matter if you're not an American company negotiating with the United States, because at the end of the day, and countries are now saying this explicitly in the TPP negotiations, until they see TPA, they're not convinced that the negotiations are at the end game and that the US is going to put its final best offer on the table. The result being that no one's putting their final best offer on the table. So the negotiations essentially don't reach the end game until TPA gets passed. And so that is true in terms of empowering US negotiators. It's also been true in making sure that all the other countries that are party to this negotiation come forward with their best offer. Great. OK. I was just going to say <laughs> three things. Trade is good. And TPA is essential. And the data flows make it all possible. Here, here. Think about that and get every member to support what is going to be good for economic growth and opportunity. Now, we're Georgetown, so we're impartial, so we shouldn't be pitching too hard, I guess, but uh, I want to pitch a little bit. I think Brad made a really good point, and that is, you know, we dominate this U.S. industry, U.S. companies dominate this field. We, European, Europe cannot hold, us a, hold a candle to what we do. Uh, maybe what's it called, um, the abracadabra in China? 
Um, the, the, Alibaba. Alibaba, Alibaba is going to get to grow to be, uh, you know, to, to, to rival Amazon someday. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're a long way ahead. And sustaining our lead really requires globalization. It requires utterly to be global, as well as to continue to build the knowledge base and to stay ahead on the, on the techno tech of the technological curve. So I think, you know, we're talking about American advantage, American jobs, and the future. And I, I really think at the end of the day that counts a lot. Anyway, thank you all for being here. Thanks. And uh, thank you especially for, to the panel. So join me in applause.